Are wines really tastier when the growers don't use pesticides? What about when it comes to what's better for you? Do red wines cause more headaches than white wines? Here to answer these questions and more, including some special selections for 2010, is Master Sommelier and Czech Please host Alpina Singh, here with the latest edition of Ask Alpina. Alpina, good to see you. Yes, thank you. Let's we'll start with the uh, first question from a viewer. And the question is, I'd like to know what Alpina thinks about biodynamic wines. Are there really any are they really any different or better for you than regularly produced wines? Alpina? All right. So uh, first of all, biodynamic wines are wines that are fined according to biodynamic methods. And so it could be considered almost like uber organic. It's a style of farming that was developed uh, according to Rudolf Steiner in the 1920s. And it follows the lunar cycle and the earth's rhythm. It's really hard to describe real quickly, but um, it's sort of like, you know, this holistic way of farming. And it's, for me, it's very difficult to answer if the bio, biodynamic wines taste better because of the farming method or because in order to follow biodynamic farming, you have to be that much more committed as a winemaker. But overall, pretty much everything I've had that's been biodynamic farm, say 80%, has been pretty tasty. But like I said, I don't know if it's because it's that or maybe it's not. I mean, I've had certainly plenty of tasty wines that are not organic. So um, it's it's a difficult question to answer. Well, can you in the tell the difference if one... Uh, I can't. If you, you cannot... put it in front of me, I couldn't tell you that this was biodynamic versus organic or whatever. Are um, they more expensive? They do tend to be more expensive because it is, you know, an elaborate farming, you know, method, just like organic produce is more expensive than conventional produce just because, you know, they... Um, you know, they do have to use certain methods of, you know, farming, et cetera. It's, it's very labor intensive. But um, I think any time somebody takes those extra steps to be custodians of the earth, it's a good thing. All right. Let's go to question number two. This is a good one. At times I get headaches after drinking some red wines. I heard tannins play a role. Is that true? And if so, can you recommend some red wines with less tannins? Well, this is, a, this is probably the number one question that I get from people. At cocktail parties uh, and that yeah, sort of thing? Why does red wine give me a headache? If I write another book, it'll be titled, Why Does Red Wine Give Me a Headache? <laughs> <laughs> All right, why does red well, wine give me a headache? I don't know. It's really difficult to uh, answer, again, because it could be the tannin. Tannins are the sort of fuzzy things that you find in the skins of the grape. They're in the uh, seeds as well as in the stem or the... Uh, the stalks of the grape. Tannins also come from oak. So it could also be, you know, the alcohol is giving a headache. Or maybe, you know, I would say perhaps start eliminating. If she thinks it's the tannins, go with a wine without tannins. So like a white wine that has not been aged in oak. And then monitor it from there. But so then, if, you get the, if you get a headache from white wine, then... Then, then you know, it's, yeah, it's maybe hard it's, to say. Maybe it's I hope it's not. I, you know, it's just, I mean, actually a, a headache specialist that emailed me once, uh, you know, uh, answered a similar question on the, on the show here, and he said that in all his research, it's really difficult to, you know, try to find an answer to that because everyone's different, so it's really hard. Um, I would say that if she thinks it's the tannins, then try, yes, a white wine, and then move to uh, thinner skin grapes. And one way you can tell if it has less tannins is by the color. If you can see through it, it's a thinner skin grape. If you can't see through the wine, then it's a thicker skin grape, which can give you a lot more tannins. So you can, there are red wines that you can... Pinot Noir, that are you know, get Gamay, Beaujolais, uh, maybe like a rosé, something like that. All right. Yes. Question number three. My wife and I own a bottle of Chateau Mouton Rothschild, 1966. The label was drawn by Pierre Alachinsky. What do you think it is worth? All right. Well, uh, Chateau Mouton is an extremely exclusive Bordeaux, and every year they commission an artist to do a different label. So that was 1966, the artist that's chosen. Um, you know, I looked around line, and this wine can be purchased for anywhere from or 250 to 350, 400 dollars a bottle. Now, not knowing how this wine was stored, it would be difficult for me to answer if it's you know, still drinkable or not, but let's just say that it was kept in pristine condition. The wine's actually tasting pretty well right now. I mean, it's a, a different style. It does have a little bit more of that age quality to it, so more like raisins and prunes. It smells like a old library. Um, <laughs> an but it's old really library. an old library, which mm, is a that good sounds smell refreshing. for me. It's a good smell for me. <laughs> Married to a writer, so nostalgia. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it, you know, he would have to first find a buyer. You know, it, what's it worth? Well, it's not worth anything until somebody gives you money for it. So, you know, Auction houses are somewhat reluctant just to buy one bottle, but I always like to tell people when they have a question like this, you know, if you know you can get this much money for it, ask yourself, is that experience worth that much money, whereas you could buy how many wines with that same dollar amount? But I would suggest that they hold on to it and maybe invite their friends that have similar bottles that they've been holding on to, and they can have one big party of lots of old wines that have been, uh, they've been saving. One big splurge. Alpina, we only have about a minute left. Real quickly, run through uh, three wines 
that you want to recommend for 2010? Yes, we have uh, Sauvignon Blanc, the Rayune Sauvignon Blanc, very well priced, a white wine, you know, all purpose that you can have around the house as a house white, so to speak. Then we have the uh, Ludovicus from Spain, a hearty red wine, again, another all purpose red, very well priced, around $14. And then finally, just to help out sort of the Australian folks, since they're having a, a grape glut, they're having kind of like a mirror, sort of what we're having financial crisis here. They're having something like that happen in their grape business. Uh, there's just too much wine, not enough buyers right now. And so so we're doing the Fireblock Old Vine Grenache, a fantastic wine for only $18. And of course, that's on the high end, but look for a lot of great deals coming your way in 2010 from Australia. And that's because, uh, what, did, did the government, did they the industry? They just overplanted. You know, it's been a 20-year wine boom happening. They overplanted, and then they didn't, you know, all of a sudden you now have competition from New Zealand, Argentina, and Chile, and there's just too much wine. They overproduce by 100 million cases. Wow. So that means good value for customers. Good who value like for customers. Wines. So buy Australia. <laughs> Alpina, thank you. Happy New Year. And for more on Alpina, oh, Happy New Year to you, Tim. Thank you very much. <laughs> for more on Alpina's recommendations, you can go to our website. You can also send your questions about wine and spirits to Alpina or questions about Chicago architecture, history, and trivia to Jeffrey Baird. Just go to wttw.com slash askchicagotonight. Also, feel free to ask by voicemail. Just call 773-509. 5360. And be sure to catch the latest episode of Check Please this Friday night at 8 o'clock.